Frederick Godburn was born in Sheffield in 1873 and he was only seven years old when his father left for America. I have no idea what happened to him during the following 10 years, but in 1891, at the age of 18, he married Eliza Linley at the parish church of St. Luke on Solly Street. It's almost a family tradition putting your wrong age on your marriage certificate. And again, it's also a Godburn family tradition that the bride walks down the aisle pregnant. His bride, Eliza Lindley, was four months pregnant when she got married. The church, St Luke's, is on Solly Street and that is in, in the heart of the Crofts district. The church itself was demolished in 1938. Uh, I looked up on the Sheffield Historic website and they said that this was the church in the picture behind the station but obviously it's not St Luke's because that would be the other side of the station. But here is a picture of the altar where they got married and here is a picture of the man who married them, the Reverend William Hillier. The marriage certificate fills in a few gaps for us. The first is it's clear that Fred never learned to read and write as we can be seen here. He puts an X for his mark. Maybe he never went to school and passed the 1980s doing whatever, probably working. His occupation is record recorded as a razor grinder which, as we have seen with some of his relatives, was not a job with much of a future. He was living in Palm Street in the not-so-bad area of Walkley. Eliza was living in Edward Street, although the census of that year marked her down as living on Daisy Bank as a servant next door to somebody who I presume is a relative because they're also called Lindley. Or maybe she was living and working in the Royal Infirmary as a servant, as a live-in servant. It's not clear which of the two is our Eliza Lindley. I suspect she was working in the Royal Infirmary and I'll give you the reason why later. The newly married couple were going to live in court number 10 on Edwards Street, which was then the family home of her sister Emma and her husband Joseph Butcher, who was a musician from Thorpe Hesley. Eliza's father Lewis, of which we will talk later, was also living with them, as was her brother Herbert. Emma and Joe Butcher were also the witnesses at Eliza and Fred's wedding. This is a photo of number three court on Edward Street, so, and, and I imagine that court number 10 wouldn't be all that different. But, and, and this photograph was taken in the 20s when they were demolishing the whole area. But it gives you some idea of what the conditions were like. and. Uh, even when these houses were in supposedly good condition, it wasn't really a very nice place to live. It's curious that Eliza's brother-in-law was a musician because family tradition says that Eliza was a very good singer who sometimes sang in pops. I don't know if this is true or not. It's one of those family stories. And I do know that later in her life, Eliza liked theatrical things, as you can see from this photo. I mentioned earlier that I, my opinion is that Eliza in 1891 was working in the Royal Infirmary. And the fact that in this photograph she's wearing a nurse's outfit, uniform, 
rather suggests that. Family tradition also states that Fred was a very good club dancer, but I have absolutely no evidence to back that up. Before we move on to what the couple did, I want to take time out to look at the family of my great-grandmother Eliza, the Linleys. Linley was a classic Sheffield surname. In fact, many companies in Sheffield were owned by somebody called Linley, and there was an even a famous murder committed against the Linley in the 19th century, and we'll talk about that later. The Linleys of my family were not precisely factory owners, far from it. Like the Godburns, the Linleys, sometimes spelt with a D but more usually without, were a family living in the heart of the Crofts area of Sheffield, with most, if not all, the family making a living from the cutlery industry. If ever there was a family that represented the Crofts, it was the Linleys. In the 1871 census, we get the same picture, albeit with an enlarged family. They had changed their address, but they were in the same area, living in a court, this time on D Street. And fast forward again to 1881, and the family had moved to a house or in a court on White Crop. During this time, the Linleys changed the dress four times, and this was quite normal in those days. As people didn't have their own furniture, um, the house usually provided a table, a bed or two, and some chairs. And because they had only a few possessions, it was quite easy to move from one dwelling to another. And normally people moved because of the rent. If the rent was suddenly lower in one place and they knew somebody who knew somebody, then they would move. What the censuses don't tell you is that Lewis Lindley was a bit of a rogue, for want of a better word. There are three prison sightings for Lewis Lindley in the Ancestry website for Wakefield Prison for various offences from drunk and disorderly to larceny theft of a glazier something or other. The writing is not very clear. But this is the most important record, the one in 1892. It shows that Lewis Linley had previous, as they say, in EastEnders. This was his fifth visit to Her Majesty's prison in Wakefield. We know that he was guilty of being drunk and disorderly, but when you think about it, being drunk wasn't illegal, so he must have been aggressive in some way. As for the stealing, I'm sure that was also related to drink. Now, I remember in the past having a record of him being arrested for deserting his family. I've since lost that document. I've lost quite a few documents over the years, I'm sorry to say. So you'll have to take my word for this, that he was arrested and sent to Wakefield Prison for a couple of weeks for deserting his family. But it's important to know about the implications of this. For him to be arrested, his long-suffering wife, Emma, would have had to go to the police station and make a formal complaint. And really, she had very little option. He was the main breadwinner, and Emma Lindley had a house full of kids to feed, to clothe, as well as other household expenses. The sergeant at the police station would then, I imagine, have to send a search and find order to his constables on the beat. I don't suppose a physical description would have been necessary, as he was almost certainly well known to the police by that time in the area. I don't think he had the wits about him to join the exodus 
of Sheffield Cutlers to America. So he probably was on some kind of bender and sleeping it off in some place or other. Lewis Linley was not the best father in the world. Emma Lindley gave birth to 13 children in all and it's curious that that's the exact number of births as her daughter Eliza and also Fred Godburn's sister Annie. Maybe 13 was the physical limit or maybe it was just a coincidence. And like the other two, Emma spent most of her adult life either being pregnant or breastfeeding or both. In the 1891 census, Louis Lindley was living in the house of his daughter Emma and her musician husband, Joseph Butcher. And he was living in their house. They were not living in his house. And his wife, Emma, had at this time obviously had enough of him and his goings on and was living out as a servant in Copley Street. When Lewis Lindley went to jail in 1892, I suspect that this was the last chance that his family gave him. By 1901, and I suspect much earlier, he became an inmate in another public institution, and this time it was the Sheffield Union Workhouse in Fair, Fair Vale, now the Northern General Hospital, and he lived there until his death in 1912. It's worth noting that none of his 12 children were prepared to put up the 13 shillings and eightpence that would have kept him out of prison. Here is a contemporary account of what awaited those who were being inducted into the establishment in the 1890s. I've actually met one of Lewis's sons, Alfred, born in 1870. This was the famous Uncle Alf, and when I say I had met him, I was just a baby at the time, and I can't remember anything about it. We states this around 1946, 47 that time. I can't remember him at all, but my mother can, and. Uh, my grandmother could, and Uncle Half was apparently a real character, and the anecdotes abound, usually related to me by my mother and my grandmother, Phoebe. So he would have been my grandmother's uncle. Half apparently was a big socialist, and according to Phoebe, who was herself a big Labour Party supporter, Alf was a Bolshevik and he was a known political and trade union agitator. He was on the famous Sheffield blacklist and found it impossible to work. One of the anecdotes is that at the beginning of the First World War, he was recruited to work at some factory or other next to the old Victoria station. Now, because it was wartime, he had to work. There was no ifs and buts, and the, the company had to employ him. While he was in the recruiting manager's office, he began to berate the manager. And through the window, he could see the young soldiers on the platform 
waiting to move off to the front, waiting for the train. And he began with something like, it's all right for thee, shining thee fat ass on that seat, while these poor buggers are going up to die for the likes of thee, and so on and so forth. And that's the story that was given by the other men that were also in the room at that time. And of course there was nothing the manager could do, he couldn't sack him, he had to take him on. Later Alf was to live with his daughter Beatrice, who married a man called Frederick Wood, up in Firth Park on number 69 Comptrol Road. Apparently my parents visited Alf quite a lot, and once when they went, he was cutting his grandson's hair with a bowl on his head. And the poor kid was fidgeting quite a lot and Alf was hitting him on the back of the head and he was saying, keep the bloody bleeding, blinded, chuffing cow in here still. And for every day expletive, the poor kid got a smack on the back of the head. He would also shout insults at neighbours he didn't like. Alf Lindley was very much in your face, but as my parents pointed out, he had a heart of gold. It sometimes makes me wonder if he had something of his dad, Lewis Lindley, in him, except maybe the part about the heart of gold. My mother certainly liked him, and she was a bit of a, a funny son so when it came to people. So if my mother liked him, he must have had something about him. Although Louis Lindley didn't seem to be a particularly violent man, he did live in a violent area. In fact, Sheffield in the 19th century was probably the most violent city in England. The most violent episode was the famous Sheffield Outrages, which more or less was a trade war perpetrated by the trade unions who were battling to get better conditions for the cutlery workers. And when I say better, it's because it would have been difficult to have made them any worse. The most famous incident was the murder of a, a workshop owner called James Lindley, who was no relation, who hired apprentices to do the work of skilled men, paying them apprentices wage, wages and pocketing the gains. The Saw Grinders Union was led by a man called Broadhead, who acted like a Sheffield version of Al Capone. He organised three attempts on Lindley's life, including a shooting, an explosion, and finally shooting Lindley dead through the window of the snug bar in a local pub. Broadhead was finally reprieved on a sort of tell-all and go-free basis, and he went to America, uh, to Connecticut, no doubt. His confessions told a tale of explosions and shooting, and planting gunpowder in people's cellars seemed to have been his preferred method. Also added to this major league stuff was the daily to and fro of life in the Crofts area. Interestingly, I read a report by an inspector or a reporter who visited the Crofts area at that time, who interviewed some of the grinders, and he described how many or most of them knew they were going to suffer early and very unpleasant deaths from grinders' asthma, as it was called, and that they somehow managed to come to terms with it, usually living by living their life to the full, or to excess. Edenism, I suppose, uh, where life in itself lost much of its value, and living in a dingy, claustrophobic area with jerry-built houses just added to it all. In Victorian times, for working people, there were three main escape routes from the misery of daily life. There was emigration, there was religion, and there was drink. In the cross area, you could probably add licentiousness and violence. So it's 
not really surprising that it produced a lot of men that were like Lewis Lindley. In the next episode, I'll be looking at how Fred and Eliza left Sheffield and found a new life, first in Draycott and then in Newcastle.